Hello and welcome to ECMATH. Today we're going to be talking about parent functions. These are functions that you need to know in order to graph transformations. There's a companion worksheet to this video that will be posted in the show notes and if you're one of my students you should be able to access it. The first key parent function is the parabola y equals x squared. Some key points that appear on this graph are 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, and 4, because 2 squared is 4, and also negative 1 and positive 1, because negative 1 squared is positive 1. Let's go ahead and plot those points on the graph. 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, and 4, and also the negative 1, negative 1. And if you feel like going further, maybe plot negative 2, and positive 4 as well. From those points, you can connect them smoothly to form the graph of a parabola. When you're plotting points to make the graph of a parabola, I really do recommend plotting one of these two points at the 2s. Plotting just the three points near 0 kind of makes a triangle. That can get confused with other graphs, but having that point further out uh, really helps you see any uh, vertical stretches that might be happening to the graph, stretches or compressions that might be happening on the graph. This next function might be a little less familiar. This is the graph of y equals x cubed, and this we call a cubic graph. Key points on y equals x cubed are 0 and 0, as before, 1 and 1, as before. When you input negative 1, negative 1 to the third is negative 1. And if we input 2, 2 to the third is 8. If you input negative 2, uh, negative 2 times negative 2 times negative 2 gives you negative 8. Let's plot all of those points on the graph and see what we get. Uh, this graph has what is called an inflection point in the middle. It does not have a really a vertex because it doesn't turn around. It doesn't have any minima or maxima. But it does have an inflection point where it changes from being sort of concave down to concave up, or like the rate of change changes from decreasing to increasing. You'll learn more about that in calculus next year. Uh, but that's what how you would describe that central point. And it's nice to try to get that in the drawing. The graph of x cubed is not, for example, just like a, a zigzag or a, a lightning bolt. It is a smooth polynomial curve. Um, one other fact about the graph of x cubed is that its domain is actually all real numbers, negative infinity to infinity, uh, which means even though it sort of looks like it just travels off the graph and maybe like st starts to trend straight upwards, if you zoomed out far enough, you would it would continue to reach all x. You can take the cube of any number. Uh, so it has that infinite domain, even though it doesn't look like it. And we usually only plot these five points of that parent. Uh, so those two graphs, x squared and x cubed, are common polynomial graphs. Uh, related to x squared is square root of x, and related to x cubed is the cube root of x. And those are also really common graphs that you might want to transform. So let's take a look at those now. Uh, the graph of the square root function is really, really useful for studying transformations because it is a function where you can really tell the difference between uh, all of the different types of reflections uh, in a way that might not be clear when you're working with just a parabola. So let us do uh, some points for the square root of x. First, key point is 0 and 0. The square root of 0 is defined and it's equal to 0. Next, key point, 1 and 1. The square root of 1 is defined and it's equal to 1. Now the next key point, you might have to go a little farther out on the x-axis, because to get a nice even square root, you need to have an x that's not 2, not 3, but actually equal to 4. So that when you take the square root of 4, you can get a y value of 2. 4 and 2. And then the third key point we're going to put on this graph is 9 and 3, because the square root of 9 is equal to 3. Let's plot all those points on the graph and see what we get.
This is the graph of the square root function. Uh, most importantly, its domain is not all real numbers. It's 0 to infinity. And also, its range, the y values that it attains, are 0 to infinity on the y-axis. So even though this graph looks like it's going to flatten out and maybe reach some kind of upper limit, if you zoom out, the square root graph will reach every y value. It just does so very, very slowly. Uh, also, some people might be wondering, why isn't there a plus or minus? Where is the other part of the graph? Well, remember the principal root rule, which is when the root is written on the page, you assume that that's the positive version of the root. If you wanted to graph the negative version of the root, negative root x, that is actually one of the transformations of this graph that we'll be graphing, but it would become a separate graph if it's not part of the parent function itself. If you look back and compare x squared to square root of x, you might notice something in the key points, which is that uh, 2, 4 was on x squared and 4, 2 was on the square root. Uh, 9 and 3 was on the square root. If we had a larger graph, 3 and 9 Actually, 3 and 9 would be right there on the parabola. Um, and we're going to use that sort of same pattern of x's and y's being reversed for uh, the polynomial and its root to graph the cube root of x. So here's our cube root function. This is just called the cube root. It doesn't have a fancy name. And some key points. Well, the cube root of 0 is equal to 0, so we would have the point 0 and 0. The cube root of 1 is equal to 1. So we'll have the point 1 and 1. The cube root of negative 1 is the number that when you cube it, you get negative 1. Well, that's negative 1. So we'll have the point negative 1, negative 1. And let's find some space. Oh, here's some space. The cube root, we have to go again larger. Uh, the cube root of 8 is 2. So that tells us that this graph needs to have the point 8, 2. And the cube root of negative 8 is negative 2. So we should need to have the point negative 8, negative 2. Let's plot all those points and see what we get. This graph looks like the graph of x cubed lying on its side. It's actually been reflected over the line y equals x, because when we do the inverse operation, we're basically switching the x's and the y's. Um, the domain is all real numbers, and so is the range. That is, even though this graph looks like it flattens out, it's going to reach all positive y's uh, to the right and all negative y's to the left, and you can take the cube root of any number, which is different than a square root, which you can only square root positive numbers, you can take the cube root of any number, and that's why the cube root goes uh, both to the left and right. So I guess I should write this domain in, negative infinity to infinity, and same for the range. Um, cube root is probably the trickiest function. Let's go uh, back to a little more tame place and look at the parent function y equals absolute value of x. Um, we've actually graphed this in class before, and it's uh, we have the definition uh, from p.1. It's a piecewise function where... Uh, absolute value of x is equal to x if x is greater than or equal to 0, and the opposite of x, or y equals negative x, if x is less than 0. That's a really good definition to have in mind. So key points, 0 and 0, 1 and 1, uh, 2 and 2, and then also negative 1, positive 1, negative 2, positive 2, because it takes negatives and makes them positive. Let's plot those points and see what we get. This is the graph of absolute value x. It looks like a v. Um, kind of boring graph, but also really nice. Uh, it has a very specific vertex. So we, if we're trying to do transformations that move the vertex around, but we don't feel like drawing parabolas, uh, we might ask you to do transformations of absolute value just because it's a really nice, convenient function. Stretches and shrinks uh, are also really easy to see because it just changes the slope of the line. So absolute value is a really nice function to be able to graph. Make sure you know this function. Uh, the last parent function that you might need to graph, and this one is probably less common than the other parent functions, is something called the greatest integer function. 
This is written as y equals int x, or sometimes you'll see it, uh, especially handwritten, as y equals these little brackets, like sort of half brackets x. Um, and these go with the idea that this is also sometimes called a floor function. Uh, so what is the greatest integer function? Uh, it is defined as uh, y will be the largest integer less than or equal to x. Remember that integers are the positive and negative whole numbers. So for example, uh, int of uh, 1.5, well, the largest integer less than 1.5 is 1. Same with like int of 1.8 is also 1. Int of 2, however, the largest integer less than or equal to 2 is 2, etc. So instead of kind of thinking about key points, let's just think about what the shape of the graph would be. From 0, the largest integer less than or equal to 0 is 0. And then for this whole continuum from 0 to 1, uh, like the int of 0.9 is still 0. And then as soon as you get to 1, int of 1 is 1. The largest integer less than or equal to 1 is 1. So I'll put an open circle at 1 on the lower half and jump to 1. And then just like we drew over here, this function stays at 1 all the way until 2. Open circle jumps up to 2. Open circle like this. This is called also a step function. Um, and you can continue this backwards, it's a little harder to think about, but just follow the pattern. The largest integer less than or equal to uh, negative half, uh, well, less than negative half would be rounding down to negative one. So you're taking whatever uh, decimal you have, rounding it down. And this is the step function, also called int. There is a related function called the uh, least integer function or ceiling function where you round up every time. Uh, we're not going to worry about that one, though. Uh, this is called the floor function. And why we like the floor function is because sometimes in transformations and our study of transformations, uh, vertical stretches and horizontal shrinks can appear the same if your graph is not very exciting. Like absolute value is just a V, a horizontal stretch compression of a V, and a vertical stretch of a V look exactly the same. But with an integer function like this, a horizontal compression and a vertical stretch look very different, and that's why we might look at that. Uh, so that's the last kind of important function called the greatest integer function. It's on your calculator if you ever want to play around with it in the math menu. Finally, we don't have to put these in, our, in your notes, but it's also worth remembering when thinking about transformations, uh, two key trig graphs, y equals cosine x and y equals sine of x. Uh, and here I have them on the same graph. Uh, to tell them apart, cosine x starts at 1, starts at its maximum, sine of x starts at 0, starts at its minimum. Uh, this graph this is a stock image I stole from the internet. Uh, it's in radians. You can uh, turn that into degrees if you wanted to label the axes. A full cycle of sine and cosine takes 360 degrees. A half cycle is 180 degrees. A quarter cycle is 90 degrees. That would be like 270 degrees. Um, but mostly, again, useful because uh, sine and cosine graphs, really, you can tell the difference between a vertical stretch and a horizontal compression, which you can't tell for other graphs. So it's really nice to know uh, those two graphs. That's going to conclude our discussion of the important parent functions that you need to know. Please stay tuned for the next video, Let's, and we'll talk about the basic transformations of all of those parent functions. Thanks for watching.